Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to Kensington. So glad you guys are joining us on the live stream. That is awesome. So hope you've got your coffee and you're ready to jump into a great service. Today we are in our last week of Kensington Goes to the Movies. We've got Michael Bouchard uh, giving the message today and we're doing The Greatest Showman. So it's going to be an awesome day. But you know, if you live within 30 minutes of our campus, uh, we are in Lake Orion. We would love for you to jump in your car. You can be here in time for the 1215 and participate in everything that's going on around here. So we'd love to see you. I would meet you in the lobby. I promise. I totally would. But uh, I hope you got your coffee. Jump in. It's going to be a great day. And uh, we're thrilled that you are with us. And don't forget, you can always connect with us online, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of it. And check out our website. Glad you're here. Have an awesome day. to kick off the morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Kensington. Uh, my name's Becky, and I'm part of our campus team here at Orion, and we are so glad you chose to be with us here on this sunny, sunny summer morning. How awesome is the weather outside? Isn't it beautiful? Uh, yeah, so if you are visiting today, we want to especially welcome you, and uh, we want to invite you to stop by our starting point area out in the lobby after the service. Um, so whether you're brand new or maybe you've been coming for a while and you're ready to take a step 
and connect in. Our team in the orange t-shirts would love to meet you, um, answer any questions you have, tell you a little bit more about who we are. And it's our hope that that will make a big church like Kensington uh, feel a little bit smaller. Um, in fact, one of our values here at Kensington is to live life in community as a family. And we have a great opportunity coming up next Sunday night where we can experience that together. Um, it's our all-in baptism event. It's happening at Stony Creek Metro Park. How many of you guys got to be there last year or the year before? We've done it for a couple years now. It's one of the rare times that we get to gather all of our local Kensington campuses and really celebrate together uh, what God has been doing. And baptism is really just a way to publicly show a personal commitment that you've made to follow Jesus. Um, it's, a, it's a spiritual marker in your faith journey. Um, and my husband and I just got to experience that a few weeks ago. We had the privilege of baptizing six people that were on our Haiti mission trip team. Uh, yes, I know we have some of you guys here right now. So it was just a beautiful um, reflection of what God has been doing in their lives and their stories. Uh, and so we hope that you will consider taking this next step if you haven't done that yet. Um, it's not too late to register. You can do that online or on our app. Or if you just want to talk to someone about what baptism is all about and why you might want to do that, you can head out to the starting point area as well. And then we have another event coming up right here Wednesday night at 7 p.m. It's our midweek service. This is another great time to gather in community and grow together. I will be doing worship together as a community, and then Cody Wilson is going to lead us through a topic that we've really been diving into together over this past year. It's this idea of how do we hear God's voice speaking, and when we do, how do we step out into the world and do what he's asking us to do to love other people? Um, so whether that's a brand new topic for you or it's something that you've already been been journeying with us, we want to invite you back here uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. All right, so today we are wrapping up uh, our series, Kensington Goes to the Movies. It's been a really fun time uh, to look at some different movies and how they apply um, to our lives. So today we have Michael Bouchard, our new student ministries director. He's going to be here to lead us through one of my all-time favorites, The Greatest Showman. Uh, so before we jump into the rest of the service, we just want to invite you to sit back, um, engage with us, pretend you're at the movies, uh, and enjoy Kensington Goes to the Movies. your hometown church for great community and quality refreshments. Help keep the auditorium clean by depositing litter in trash receptacles. No talking or texting during the service. And be sure to use the Kensington app or visit the Starting Point team after the service to learn more about Kensington and receive a free gift. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. It's more than just a movie. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Kensington Goes to the Movies, and we are going to play a little trivia game here. And we have Tracy and Marty, so give them a hand, our brave souls. All right. So do you guys like uh, Family Feud? Sure. Yeah? yeah? This, this is nothing like that. So, all right. So, anyway, so we are going to play a game. It's more like who wants to be a millionaire based on movie trivia. And so also, you can ask the audience one time for help. This is your audience over here, this half. Marty, this is your half. Or you could ask one person one time, kind of like phone a friend for some help. If you get the answer wrong, you, Marty, could steal, or Tracy, you could steal with the audience's help. So this is participation, so I encourage everybody to engage. Okay, ready? And this is a point system. So these are for five points. 
and Tracy, we'll start with you. We're going to go to movie quotes. Okay, so what, make sure you speak into the microphone. All right, here we go. What movie is this quote from? Hello, my name is Yanino Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Which movie is that from? Oh, oh, oh she's just yelling it out. Just yelling it out. Oh, so there's your audience help right there. Oh, audience, you got to be quiet unless they ask for it. Well, we'll give you points there. Five points for Princess Bride. Okay, Marty, here is your quote. Why so serious? Why so serious? Marty. All right, you got to talk to the mic. Okay, I need some help. Are we going to do uh, one person, or do you want uh, the audience participation? Anybody. Audience. Dark Knight. All right, say Dark Knight. The Dark Knight is correct. So, okay, so you have both used your audience already. Are you only get one? Whoa, that's it. This game's going to go quick. All right, here we go. Where's this quote from? I am serious, and don't call me sure. I am serious and don't call me Shirley. That's her. This is Tracy. I'm gonna use my one person. One okay. One person. Raise a hand, somebody, if you know it. You're the wrong audience. All right. The striped shirt right there. Airplane. Airplane is correct for five points. Way to go. All right, so you are done with your help. This is it. Marty, here goes your quote. Go ahead. Make my day. What movie did that come from? Dirty Harry. That is incorrect. The correct movie is Sudden Impact. Dirty Harry was the character. Uh, uh, I don't care if this is church. We play rough here. Now I can get one wrong. That's okay. That's it. Uh, All right, back to you. Tracy, multiple choice. I think you're going to know this one. E.T., what type of candy does Elliot use to persuade E.T. to come into his room? M&M's, Reese's Pieces, Skittles, or Sour Patch Kids? Shh, audience. Reese's Pieces. That is correct for 10 points. All right, Marty, multiple choice. Here you go. You're going to know this one. Where was Forrest Gump shot, therefore sending him home from Vietnam? The ear, the leg, arm, or buttocks? He was shot in the buttocks. He was shot in the buttocks. Correct for 10 points. Way to go. All right. Now, Tracy, this is going to be a little hard one. I'm, yeah. Ready for this one? Can you name Rocky's opponents in all Rockies, one through five? In all, all five? I, all five, yes. No. Can you name one? Uh, the Russian. The Russian. <laughs> narrows it down to about 40 million. All right. Marty. Yes? You can steal, and the audience can help. Yay, good. All right. Do you know any of the opponents? In- yeah, Draco is the... He's the Russian. Russian. Yes. Um, Apollo Creed. There's two. Clubber Lane. Lane was three. That one. We got Ivan Drago. Drago. There's two more. Tommy Gunn. We got a Rocky fan out here. We need one more. We got one more. Oh, the repeat. Josh yeah. Korn. <laughs> you put this together. You can't say that. Oh, I'm not giving anybody points, but that was terrible. Oh. Apollo Creed was in one and two. It's a little bit of a trick question. Yeah. Anyway, again, didn't work for you. All right, here we go, Marty. Name four actors that have played Batman. No help from the audience yet. I see them all. You got to talk to the microphone. I see them all. I just can't. Uh... Do I have you one person, right? You can ask one person. Who if anybody thinks they can here? help, raise your hand. Oh, now he's Speak shaking up. his head no. What? Oh, there's a hand up there. I need a hand with a face. I think I see Dana. Face. Is that you, Dana? I know that. That was a four. That's correct. Like Way that. to go. Yeah, Way to right. go. We also forgot about Val Kilmer and uh, George Clooney. No, he said no. Oh, and uh, unfortunately, Ben Affleck. Yeah, it was. That's, that's terrible. So, Marty, very well. You got. 15 points. All right, last ones. Here we go. The songs. These are worth 25 points each. Which movie is this song from? Go 
ahead. Is that Star Wars? No. <laughs> hey! Wow. All right, Marty. You can steal with the help of the audience. Harry Potter. Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. There you go. All right, Marty, this is your song. Sure. The good, the bad, and the ugly? Good, bad, and the ugly. No help there. Nicely done. All right, Tracy. We're going to go back to high school. You ready? At least my high school. My You're high school younger than me. Right. Yeah. The movie, yeah. I don't think I was in high school. When this you weren't in high school yet? No. My bad. There was like three of them. I thought maybe one of them was... No? Um, Use the microphone. Was, uh, what's his name? The comedian. Yeah. He was funny. Yeah. He was, really <laughs> he was a funny guy. Yes. Played Gumby on SNL. Yes. I can picture him, but I don't know the name of the movie. Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood. Yeah, that doesn't... We got time's up. Movie. Marty, what's the movie? Uh, audience? He gets a lot of Beverly audience Hills help. Beverly Hills Cop. There you go. All right. And just for fun, Marty is winning by a landslide. We're going to go to the last one here. Let's play the last movie. Here we go. You guys don't know. Anybody? Avengers, very good, all right. Hey, give these guys a hand for playing. And do me a favor, you guys can go ahead, stand up and say hello to a few people and we'll continue in a moment.
million dreams. Is there anybody, anybody on this planet that dreams better than kids? No, that's what they do, right? They're always coming up with new ideas and, and what life could be, and there's so much promise. And a lot of the stuff they may tell you may not even make much sense, but you know that they're dreaming about their future all the time. We dream and, until we don't, until we stop. Something happens, doesn't it? We get a little older. We become wiser. We know what reality is, and as it gets defined for us, we lose our ability to dream. Maybe we, we attempt to follow our dreams and, and we fail, or maybe our dreams fail us, or maybe someone else fails us, or, or someone places something on our shoulders to weigh us down. And if we're not careful, we may end up reaching the place where we're dreamless. So my question to you as we begin, if the, if the slate were wiped clean, would you dream again? If you had a chance for a fresh start, would you take it? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for, for, for casting dreams for us and for dreaming for what our future could be, so much that you sent your son for us. So we ask that today, as we hear these stories, some may be familiar for us. I, I pray that we can hear them with fresh ears. I pray you open our minds so that we can begin to have it renewed and, and, and also open our hearts so that we can learn how, how best to love and live, but also, maybe even more importantly, how to be fully loved by you. We thank you for being our Father, and we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. How many of you just want to keep singing with them? Yeah? Yeah. Weren't they great? Let's give it up for Jack and Ella. But seriously, I would, love, I, have, I would love to hear them all day long. If they could just like follow me around like singing that song on repeat. Anybody here a fan of The Greatest Showman? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I got to do a lot of subbing last school year, and it was so fun. I would mess with them all the time. I would just like say a line from one of the songs and listen to a kid somewhere. A kid would start singing, and then the whole class would sing, except for those five kids that were like, ugh. It's such a great movie. I love that movie. And I'm a movie guy. When I was growing up, I didn't want to be me. I wanted to be somebody else. And that someone else was Luke Skywalker, by the way. Yeah. And some of you may have felt that before. I love movies and the stories that they tell, which is why we're doing this series, Kensington Goes to the Movies. And uh, by the way, I loved this movie, Greatest Showman, so much. I'm ashamed to admit slightly that I watched it four times in theater. Four times. I don't own it now. They got too much of my money. I'll never own it. But yeah, four times. I love that. And one of the greatest things in this is uh, P.T. Barnum. If you're not familiar with the story, P.T. Barnum is the main character. And it shows his, um, his really, he's the guy that started the circus here in, here in the States. And it, it's pretty awesome. All the circuses that are around really kind of started from his vision. And with in him and his life, his journey and his journey was so fascinating. And he's a guy who followed his dreams. And the whole movie is him following the dreams that he saw. Now, if you haven't seen it yet, it starts with him as a young kid singing that very song that we heard. A million dreams. I've got a million dreams. Things that I would love to do. But he had a problem. He, uh, he didn't have any money. His family was poor. His dad was a tailor. And actually, the, the movie starts out with him in the house of this wealthy family, and he's got a crush on the daughter, and he makes her laugh. And the dad notices, her dad, her father notices, and he is not having what's going on between him and his daughter. So he goes down to him, and he, he slaps him. And he, he, he's, and he tells him, you would never be worth somebody like her. You're just a tailor's boy. And instantly, a lie was implanted deep inside of him. And the rest of the movie is him trying to prove everybody wrong. He knows what's inside. But this, this lie that, said, that, his, that the, the father said was, you, you're not worth her, which really internalized means you're not worth it. You're not worth it. 
So his, the rest of his journey is that. Eventually, he does get the girl, though. I think we got a picture of them. He does marry the girl, and they, have, and they start their family. And when he, when he goes and picks her up from her father's house, the last thing his father sa- that her father says before they leave the door is, she'll be back. She'll be back. She's going to chase her adventures with you, and she'll be back. And so then he pursues his dreams, but he starts it on something crumbly, and it reminds me, when I was watching this movie, it reminded me of a story that Jesus told about, a, about another young man that once chased his dreams at the cost of everyone else. So there's this story you might be familiar with called The Prodigal Son, which I think is a terrible name for it, and I'll tell you about that later. But The Prodigal Son, anybody heard of that before? Yeah, maybe you have. So it starts with Jesus in a public space, teaching people, and while he's teaching people, while he's just sitting there, people are noticing that the sinners are coming around him, people who, that the righteous, the religious people kind of weren't fans of, and so the religious people kind of got upset. In fact, it starts this way. It says, now the tax collectors, which were the political and religious traitors of the day, the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. And here what happens is Jesus is surrounded by people, but there's these grumbly religious people. You've probably never seen anybody like that before, right? People who, they knew God's laws. They knew the Old Testament, right? They knew how things used to be. They know all the things that God said. And man, they just got really upset when people didn't do it their way. But that doesn't happen today, right? Right? No, that doesn't happen. Well, Jesus sees this, and he sees their discontent. And, he, uh, and so then he continues, and he, what he does is he gives a couple of stories. He tells three stories, one about a lost coin and one about a lost sheep, and he tells this one. Now, I want to pause for a moment. Um, I'd like to actually have the ushers come down. Uh, we're going to take our offering. I was supposed to do that at the beginning. Um, the ushers are going to come down, and uh, they're going to pass the offering plate. And I want to say, when you're, um, if you're here and you're brand new, Go ahead and let this moment slide right on by, and uh, we are seriously just glad you're here and glad that you've joined us this morning. But if you're here and you're part of Kensington, you're part of this weird, crazy circus that we are, right? It's a weird group of misfits, and it's awesome. Then uh, this is our way that we partner with what God is, is doing here in Kensington and in our neighborhoods and across the world. So Jesus... He, he hears the grumblings. He sees the look in people's eyes. So, so he's, he tells these stories of a lost coin, of a lost sheep, things being found. But then he tells some, a different kind of story. And it continues. It says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, these, these stories, there's a certain word that we have for these stories that Jesus tells. Anybody know what that word is? That's right. Yeah, you're kind of mumbling out there. I hear there's a sea of rumbling. Yes, parables. Yes, parables. And what a parable is, it's a story with a deeper meaning. Now, when he tells stories, he doesn't just have one level. There are so many layers. And if we read this story with a 21st century Western culture mindset, then we might miss what Jesus is saying because... For us, we're used to having a society that is based on right and wrong. Our rules, our laws, everything is based off of right and wrong. And we, are, we like to follow the facts. We are a fact-based society. But with Jesus' time, that's not quite what it was. In, actually, in first century Jewish culture, what was more important sometimes than right and wrong, which they were important, but what was more important was shame and honor. You did not want to shame your family. Everyone was in this together. What you did was a reflection of your family. What your family did was a reflection of you. And you wanted to bring honor to your family and not shame. And so here, with the father, he would have been the patriarch. He's the guy that everything was owned by him. Everything in the umbrella of the family is owned by him. All the money, like all the property, all of the business, all the cows, whatever, they are all owned by him. And when he died, he would divide it up amongst his family, amongst his, really, his sons. So for this son, the younger son, to come up to him and say, Dad, I want what's mine, it is the equivalent of him coming and saying, Dad, I wish you were dead already. 
Now, dads, if your son came up to you and said they wanted your 401k right now, what would you say? <laughs> you think that conversation would go well? No. Well, it didn't, go, it didn't set well for them too. For somebody listening to this story, they would be like, what? He wants what? He wants all of his money? Are you kidding? He wants his college tuition. Now he's 12 years old. No way. No, I'm not going to give that to you. No. And this is, this is the gravity that we're supposed to feel in this. Now, you might be upset and thinking that. Of course, a dumb thing to ask, right? Yes, we are very quick to judge. I'm very quick to judge this man. But what I would like us to do is something that Jesus would invite us to do. See, when he tells a story, we're supposed to see ourselves in it. So I would like you to sympathize for a minute. Because maybe you've never gone to your parents and said, hey, I want all of your money. I want everything you're going to leave to me. I want it now. All of your insurance, all that. Maybe you've never done this, but... Have you ever been a young adult ready to break free from your family? Ready to follow the dreams that you have? Ready to live your life? Ready to be your own authority? Maybe you've been there. I know I have. Or maybe, maybe, well, see this guy, he was so driven to be in charge. He was driven to chase his successes. He was driven to be the God of his own life, really, is what he was doing. And he was so driven that he was willing to neglect wisdom, what was healthy, and he, might even, and he was even willing to bulldoze his family and the people who loved him the most along the way. Some of you are like, that sounds a little bit like kindergarten. <laughs> it is a little like kindergarten. But some of you have felt this before. Some of you have felt the sting of someone in your life who has cut you out, who has stomped on you or a family member in pursuit of what they wanted. Some of you have seen that in your own children before. But have you ever been there? I think if you're like me, you'd be honest enough to say, yeah, I have. Maybe I, don't, maybe I try not to live that way all the time, but there are times that I have been that way. So he asks his dad. He says, dad, I want the money. And to everyone's surprise, Jesus says, the dad says Yes. He says, you can have it. So he gets what he wants. How does it go? Well, it says this. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country. Note, pagan country comes in later. A distant country and squandered his wealth in wild living. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, that's college right there. <laughs> now, when I graduated high school, I was so excited for my open house and I was really more excited for what was in the envelopes that I got. And I counted it all out. It was just over $2,000, and that's a lot of money. And I didn't have a bank account. So my mom, uh, she said, hey, you need to go put it in a checking account. We're going to save it for when you, got, when you get to college, okay? Spend it wisely. And I'm like, yeah. So we went and we set up a bank account, and uh, I got checks. And they didn't have any Star Wars ones, so I got Lion King. So I had Lion King checks. And I was so excited. Now, some of you are like, what's that check? Everybody under the age of 18, we didn't use our debit cards all the time, okay? We actually wrote on pieces of paper and handed to people, and it became money. It's magic. So I got my, I got my magic paper, my Lion King paper, and I was writing checks for everything, $1.50 here. I mean, I was taking it into, like, gas stations that they would take it. I just wanted to write money out. Well, about three weeks later, I got a phone call saying that I had overdrawn $2,000 in three weeks. I was buying everything. I was taking all my friends out for lunch, and I was taking them out for dinner, because I was responsible now. And I even bought a mini disc player. Do you know what that is? No, no one does. They told us it was the future. They lied. <laughs> they lied. And this is what he did. He spent everything he had. He had nothing left. He just squandered it. He had the parties. He had the women come over. He had, it was like, actually it was like Pleasure Island on Pinocchio. This is the image you're supposed to get. Whatever he wanted, he did. P.T. Barnum in this movie, he gets to that point too. He gets to the point where he does whatever he wants. He works super hard. He follows his dream. He chases it and he has success. He comes out on top. And we have, I think we have an image from that, from when he, now everywhere he goes, people want to know him. He walks into this beautiful, beautiful place, and um, after one of his shows, he actually has a little dinner party afterwards where he shows off his new talent, and his in-laws walk in for the first time since he got married. And while they come, when, when they're in there, he blasts them. He gets revenge. 
He got everything he wanted. He's like, yeah, she's coming back to you? Okay. See, he finds himself in the same place as the young, the young man, the young millennial in our, in, in our Bible story. He had everything he wanted, and he did whatever he wanted. But then, what happened? Should be enough, right? Well, it says, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine, and he began to be in need. Have you ever gone to Cedar Point with a bunch of middle schoolers? No? You should try it sometime. It's super fun. We do it every year. All right, yeah. No, actually, it is a lot of fun. I love it. But I have learned over the years that there's a rule whenever we take middle schoolers over to Cedar Point. Uh, by the way, I, have, I don't know if I introduced myself. I'm Michael Bouchard. I'm the student ministries director here. Okay. Yeah, hi, yeah. See, see how my brain works? Okay. So it's per- I'm perfect for middle school, right? So uh, I've got some rules that I put in place whenever we take middle schoolers to Cedar Point. And the number one rule is if you think you're going to spend your money Before the day's done, give it to me. That's it. Because without fail, what happens every year is we get to the end of the day and there's some kid in my group who's got a big giant fuzzy hat on or some kind of shirt or got like henna tattoo or something. And then he's like, I'm hungry. I got a dollar (laughs) fifty. And this is what he's experiencing. It's supposed to be laughable. Jesus says he spent all he had and then there was a famine and he found himself in need. It's supposed to be laughable. It's supposed to be juvenile. But man, it really isn't when you're in it, though. It isn't. When you quit the job and your new one, line, your new one fell through before the transfer. It doesn't feel as good when the person that you had just burnt bridges to stand up for betrays you. It doesn't feel as good when you're in his spot. It continues, it says, So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed, for, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. What Jesus is doing is very, very, very specific. Every single detail he puts into that sentence matters. So if you were a Jewish first century, I mean, a first century Jewish person and you heard pigs, what word would you automatically think of? Some of you know this. What do they call pigs? Unclean. 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 It was against law for them to eat pigs, touch pigs, whatever. You stayed away from them. They were considered unclean. So they were kind of like Bible Times Ohio State fans. (laughs) Becky Lee is going to get me at 12.15 for that one. (laughs) See, he's working for a foreigner. Unclean. He's in a different country, a pagan country. Unclean. He's the servant of pigs, unclean. He holds their food in his hand, which is trash, unclean. And then at the end of it, no one will feed him. He's ignored. So what's Jesus saying? Here he is. He's done it all. He did everything he wanted. And how was he left? Unclean, 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 and ignored. See, living living as his own God, living on his own authority, it left him with nothing. Nowhere to go, and nobody cares. And this is where P.T. Barnum finds himself near the last part of the movie. See, he had lived his dreams, but it was never enough. There's a song, right? Some of you want to sing, never enough. Right. It was never enough. She sings it better than I do, clearly. (laughs) But it wasn't enough. No matter what he did, it wasn't enough. Why? Because he couldn't change how he felt on the inside and who he was. It wasn't enough, and he finds himself with nothing. The tour that he had spent his life savings on fell apart. He came home. His house was repossessed. The circus had burnt down, and his wife had gone back to her dad. And all he thought of was, you'll be back, or she'll be back. She was. He was left at rock bottom. Rock bottom hurts. It's embarrassing. It's shameful. And here he is. See, sometimes rock rock bottom happens at a bar, but sometimes rock bottom happens in a pig pen. So here he is, surrounded by pigs. And it says, he, when he came to his senses, he said, how many 
of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say, Father, okay, here it goes. Remember when you were in trouble and you got to, you got to think about it before your parents found out you were in trouble? And then you started thinking of what you were going to say and you're going to plan out your own consequences? Like, like the one time when I was in, when I was in fifth grade and my mom would, uh, went to Texas for a couple of weeks and when she was gone, I just played video games and so I failed a test and I had to get it signed so I forged it and then my teacher found it and then I still had two more weeks before mom came home so I knew she was going to get when she came home so I had it all planned out and what I was going to tell her. Mom, I'll be grounded for this long and I'm so sorry and I'll never do this and I'll give up this. Like I had it all planned out so she wouldn't be in charge of it, right? This is what he's doing. He says... Okay, I'm going to sit out and tell my father. I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned against you in heaven. I am no longer, worried, uh, no longer worthy to be called your son. He doesn't just say that, though. He actually believes this. There's a lie inside of him right now. He believes he's not worthy. And then the third one is, so make me like one of your hired servants. I've sinned. I'm not worthy. Make me a servant. So he got up and go, went to his father. He has nowhere to go, and he, he says, okay, I'm going to go home. Maybe dad will at least let me be a servant. Pause. Step back. Now you are a a first century Jewish person. You're listening to this, and your blood is boiling. He's going to go back? Really? He's going to... He thinks he can go back to him. After all that he's done, he's going to show his face back at that house. You have got to be joking, Jesus. There is no way. And see, they also knew that there were laws in the Old Testament about sons and daughters who did that. What did they do to them? They stoned them. He doesn't need to be a servant. He doesn't deserve to be a servant. He should be stoned. He should be killed. This is what Jesus is doing, and he's doing it on purpose. So while everyone is sitting on the edge of their seats, wondering what's going to happen, Jesus flips the tables, and he says this, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Hold up. While he was a long way off, his father saw him. What does that mean? His dad was looking. Every single day, he had an, even if he was at his work, he had an eye on the road. Why? He he was waiting for his son to come back. He was just longing for him to come back. He wasn't ignoring him. He wasn't like, ah, good riddance. He's waiting for him to come back. So a long way off, he sees him. And he was filled with compassion, and he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around and kissed him. What? There are so many things wrong with this. First of all, for in Eastern culture, it was humiliating for a, for a grown man to run in public. If you were not in a race, then you, were, you had a certain stature about you. You did not run. You sent your servants to run. Servants run. Dads don't. Servants run. Patriarchs don't. He didn't care. Not only was he not supposed to run, on top of that, he embraced him, and not with his hands. <laughs> Some of you know that had been you. No. He takes, instead of his hands, he uses his arms. He embraces him. He pulls him in. And I just imagine the son going, uh, what the what? Are you kidding me? So he, he holds him. Have you ever seen anybody embrace someone like that? A couple of weeks ago, we had some of our, some of our teenagers go on uh, the, the, the Haiti trip. Anybody go? Anybody in there that went? Oh, you guys went, yeah. Yeah, we got to see you guys after your crazy trip when you got held back for like days and days. And I got to be there and watch you guys when, I, when everyone was reunited. That's what happens at airport terminals, right? You see people who haven't seen each other for a long time and oh, they just give this embrace. And this is what he does. He grabs his son and holds him in. All of his actions imply embarrassment upon embarrassment upon embarrassment. And the father doesn't care. His son is more important. So I could see the son flinching, stammering. Because then with his dad hugging him, he starts into his speech. He's like, the, the, the son said to him, Jesus said, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. He goes through his spiel. I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants... He cuts him off and says, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, bring a ring and put it on his finger and sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf, fire up the grill, man. We're going to have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine is, was dead and is alive. He was lost and he is found. He doesn't get through all three. Do you notice that? He gets through one and two and dad's like, shut up. 
Stop it. He didn't even get to say, I'm not your son. And because he calls him it, he says, This son of mine is back. Have you ever been lost before? About eight years ago, I got, the, I got a chance to go to Israel. I've been there twice, and this was my second trip. And let me tell you, if you've never been, go. Whether it's Kensington trip or another trip, it, it, it's, it's amazing. It'll bring these stories to life in a way you've never, had, you've never experienced before. And so we went, and um, I was there for a week, and then our edge, our high school students showed up the, the next week. So we were in our, our week before they showed up, and we got to stay in old Jerusalem, in the old city. And it was amazing. We wake up every morning with the, to the smell of fresh bread and all these spices, and we'd hear roosters walking through the streets. And yeah, we did. And there were kids screaming and hollering and parents yelling at kids. Apparently, it doesn't matter where you are, that happens. And so every morning we would get up and go get fresh bread. And there was one morning I woke up before everyone else. And the trip leader said, don't go by yourself. But I was like, I'm an adult now. I'm okay. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. So I didn't tell anybody and I just took off. And I went and got some bread and I got some coffee. and was just enjoying the sights and walking around. And then I realized I didn't remember which way to come back. Because in the city, it's, it's like a maze. It's these little, little alleyways everywhere. And I couldn't read anything. And even if I did, I didn't know the names of the streets and I realized I didn't even know the name of the place we were at, that we were at, and I didn't have a phone number. I was dumb. And I, and I started freaking out. I was like, no one's going to know. I'm going to live on the streets of Jerusalem for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, somebody please help this dumb American find his way. I, tra- I walked around for three hours, three hours, panicking on the inside. And I'm like, and I'm supposed to lead students in a week? Okay. But eventually, I found my way back. I found something that led me to somewhere that led me to somewhere, and I found the hostel. And I, I've never wanted to kiss the ground more than when I got there because I was found. And here, the son is found. He had been lost. He didn't even know who he was anymore. And he walks home. He comes in, and his dad meets him. He meets him where he's at. It's a beautiful story, isn't it? But Jesus knows not everyone's cheering when they hear it. Because he knows the people who are grumbling at the beginning, they're not on team younger brother. They're on team older brother. Because there are two brothers in this story. So Jesus doesn't end it there. He continues. He says, The older brother became angry and refused to go in because he'd been working in the fields. He heard there was a party, and he, when he found out what it was, he didn't want to go. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, after all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fatted calf for him. Tell me how you really feel. He says, are you kidding me, dad? I haven't left you. I've been here the entire time. I haven't left you. I know your laws. I know your rules. I'm doing them. He wasn't. And you're going to accept him? Really? Let him be a servant. Let him be my servant. I've done it right. I voted for all the right politicians. Can you believe those people? I did it right. And you want to say he's worth as much as me? You want to say you love him just as much as me? You didn't give me anything. And I think it's fascinating. What does he call himself? A slave. He's been in the house the entire time and he still sees himself. He sees himself as a slave and he didn't even go out to the pig pen. So the father, which by the way, I don't think this should be called the prodigal son. I think this story should be called the good father because this is what he says. He said, my son, I see him put in his arm around him. My son, ah, man, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. It's a, the, the cow's always been there. You want to get it, get it. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours is dead and is alive again and he was lost and he's been found. He says, your brother is back, be glad. And I find this so fascinating that there are two different brothers in this story, two different lives, and yet God teaches, I mean, the father teaches them the same lesson. He tells them the same lesson. They both need the same lesson. And the lesson is, it's not on you. One finds himself in following his own way, and one finds himself in all the rules. And he says, your your identity doesn't depend on you. It didn't depend on their circumstances, their actions, their successes, or their failures. 
Their sonship relied on one thing and one thing only. You know what it was? Him being their father. They weren't a son because of what they did. They weren't sons because of what they didn't do. They were sons because he was their father. And no matter how far they walked away or how close they stayed, he loved them and he'd do anything for them. And the greatest thing about this story is when Jesus is telling it, he's not telling it about some random strangers. He's telling your story and mine. Because at some point, we are all the younger son, aren't we? We all find ourselves, sometimes daily, in a place where we've tried it on our own and we failed. And our father, this father, is God. And he doesn't look at us when we fail, when we mess up, when the things that we put our faith in fall apart, because they always do, they did for him, they do for us. We will never be able to sustain, our, sustain ourselves forever. Eventually, we run out of steam, and usually quicker than we think we will. And we have a father who doesn't look down on us and belittle us. He doesn't berate us. He's the father that's standing at the edge of the driveway, waiting. And when he sees us, he runs. But sometimes we're also like the older brother too, where we're, we do the right thing. But, but sometimes we're, we're at home, right? We're, we're here, we know the truth. We're here, we follow Jesus, we believe in Jesus, and we, we know the truth. And yet we still put it on ourselves, don't we? That's what the older brother does. That word is striving. By the way, that's what that word is, striving. Where we try to still do it on our own. Like we think that if we do one thing wrong, we're always, like, we always one step away from being the younger brother, right? We're one step away from being in the pig pen. And what we find from the, from the older brother is that you can be home and your heart's still out in the field. And I know this because this was me. This is me. Actually, I had an experience with this this week. Um, slightly embarrassed to tell because I am a pastor. I am someone who works at a church. I have for many years, over a decade, and um, I, I follow Jesus all of my life. And I have struggled my whole life with prayer, believe it or not. And God has done some crazy things. He's done some amazing things in my life, and yet there are still times and seasons where I struggle with approaching God, my Father. And this, actually, this past Monday, I had this experience where, where I was spending some time praying. We're going through a lot of seasons of change here, uh, here at our campus this summer. And I'm changing jobs and, and moving over to student ministries. And we had all this stuff going on this week. And I was just so tired. And I was asking God, what do you want me to know? And why do I have a hard time talking to you? I shouldn't. And in my mind, I realize that every time I pray, I approach God. And I, I try to visualize when I pray. Uh, and I, I, pro, I approach him from behind, like he's sitting on a park bench or he's you know, sitting, in, sitting in the city over on like a banister or something. This is how I vision him. And I realize every time I approach him from behind, like he can't be bothered. Like he doesn't want to be bothered. Like he, he's just, if, oh, it's Michael again. I know it's not true, but that's how I do it. And I said, what do I do? I asked him, I said, what do I do? How do I change this? And I, and I heard in my mind, and I had this feeling, change how you approach me. And I said, how do I approach you? And then I saw an image from when I was young. And I remember we, we lived in, um, at this time we were just outside of Flint. Uh, we were living in Montrose and, and we had this large ranch, well not large, but large property, small ranch. And, and my dad loved woodworking, and, and I came around the corner, and I'll never forget this. I came around the corner, and my dad was doing what he always did. He'd made random wood stuff for our families, whether it was dressers or toy boxes. It was all rectangular, because that's all he knew how to do, just straight up and down. Um, and, but I remember coming in, and he was working with his saw, and he, and he saw me. And he, he dropped everything. And then he came down and gave me a hug, and then he asked me if I wanted to help. And God said, that's how you approach me. I'm your dad. I'm not your slave driver. I love you. And I wondered how many of us here today 
Maybe we were the younger son, but now we're the older son, and we've lived, now we're living our life striving. And whether we're out in the fields or next to the house, he's calling us all the same thing. He's saying, get in here and party. Get in here and dream. Get in here and live. Because this is what happens when we trust in Jesus. What's his is ours. The life he has becomes our life. The righteousness, the goodness that he has becomes ours. No matter, the the slate gets wiped clean. The mercy, the grace, the strength that he has becomes ours. And the sonship he has becomes ours. Paul, one of the writers in the New Testament, writing to one of the first churches in a town called Galatia, he says in Galatians, so you are no longer a slave. When you come home, when you trust in Jesus, when you accept his forgiveness, you are no longer a slave ever again. But you are God's child, and since you're his child, he's also made you an heir. What does that mean? All the goodness, all the greatness God has is yours. Every single bit of it is yours then. You don't have to take, there are no 12 steps to coming home. You just turn around and you're home. Why? Because he comes to you. He runs to you right where you're at. Some of you know this, actually, and some of you have experienced this. And this, this weekend, this next weekend, we have our baptism down at Stony Creek, and I hope you come to it. I hope you get a chance to come, whether or not you, you've been baptized before, or you just want to see somebody, or see, see people get baptized and celebrate as a giant, crazy circus, or maybe you follow Christ, but you've never made it public. You've never taken that step to let others know. We want you to come join us this next weekend. At the, end of the, at the end of the movie, P.T. Barnum, he approaches his wife, who has lost everything, and he says, I'm sorry, I failed us. And she looks at him and she says, I, I, don't, I don't love you because of what you did. I don't love you because of what you do. I don't follow you because of the things that you do. I follow you because I love who you are. And then he walks back to the rubble. I think we have a picture of this, and it's one of the coolest moments in the movie. He walks back to the burning, smoldering rubble of the circus, surrounded by his crazy group of weirdo friends, and together they decide to dream again, to dream a different life. But this time, he knows who he is. So my question for you is, who are you? Who are you? How do you see God? Do you see him as if you're a slave? Do you see him as a slave driver? Do you see him as someone who's aloof and far off? Or do you see him as your dad who is waiting to embrace you? I know some of you are here and you're like me and you're the older brother. And you're like, I know it. I know it. I know he loves me. I know I believe, but there are days where I just don't do it right. Guess what? It's not on you. So what would the father say to you in this situation? Come on in. Come on in. It's not about what you do. You're my son. You're my daughter. Stop striving. Don't worry about what anybody else does. Stop judging the other people who don't vote like you. Stop judging all the other people who don't live like you do. Reach out and invite them in. Come in and bring them with you. And some of you are like the younger brother, though. Whether you've known it for a while or you're just realizing it right now, you're like, yeah, I want to come back. What he would say to you is, come home. He tells the older brother, come in. He tells the younger brother, come home. So maybe today is the day that you get to come home. And there might be someone in here who you're like, yeah, I know, I really want to, but I've done so much. You don't understand what it's like for me here in this pig pen. You don't understand the mess I've got myself into. I would not be welcome here. What I want to say to you is that is a lie. One of my favorite things, my, no, not one of, my favorite thing about the movie, The Greatest Showman, is the misfit group. Because you know what? That's what we are. That is a perfect view of what the church is. It's a bunch of people, broken people, who are sons and daughters and who are not defined by their actions, their past, or their circumstances. So what we would like to say to you is come home. Come join us. Come join the party. Because what we've learned from Jesus is that no matter who you are, you belong. 
no matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done, you belong in the kingdom of God, and we are here with you. So let today be the day that you choose to remember that you are, through Jesus, a child of God. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for everything you've given to us. And I just, oh man, I just ask that if there's anyone here today who is feeling like, man, we, I'm, a, I'm a son who's not acting like it. Or maybe someone's here that really wants to be a son and, or a daughter and maybe feels like they're not worthy. I, I pray that they will remember the father reaching out to the son. And whenever they close their eyes, they'll see that face of the father right in front of them. And I pray that they won't stop seeing your face. God, I, I ask that. I ask that, that, that they see your face and they don't stop until they, until they come and give themselves to you. Thank you for leading us home. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. You love. 
May you this week live inside the doors of your home. May you live in the party and dream what God could have for you. May you trust that everything is clean because of Jesus and dream big because if you're his son and you're his daughter, it is all yours. Amen? All right. So if you would, if you'd like somebody to pray with you, our prayer team is going to be down front. If you'd like to talk with somebody more about what's going on in your heart and what you're thinking, and make sure you come back on Wednesday. Join us at midweek. And then uh, you can also sign up for baptisms online. We'll see you this Wednesday and we'll see you Sunday. All right. Have a great week.